Hi everyone, I would like to uh, uh, present to you a concept of emergence that is really very important uh, key concept and paradigm in various um, avenues of uh, science and philosophy, including system theory, art, science, applicable really to many different principles. And what emergency is about? What is actually emergency? Uh, emergency occurs when a certain entity is observed to have properties its part don't have on their own. So properties or behaviors which emerge only when parts interact in a wider whole. Uh, so it's not surprising that this uh, concept is uh, widely applicable in biology. And as a matter of fact, the whole field of systems biology to great extent mm, relies on the principles of emergence, of interaction between components and how components build the systems. And we consider live organisms, uh, uh, for example, multicellular organisms or communities of organisms as emergent forms. Emergence, uh, grow or evolution of more complex forms through simple rules. Self-organization describes characteristic relationships in the emergent system. This is created by feedback mechanisms that either amplify an effect, and the, they make positive feedback, or they dampen an effect, making a negative feedback. So it's a, it's a system that is being regulated. There are certain mechanisms of uh, feedback regulation. Uh, how did I come up, how did I encounter first uh, the concept of emergence. I, I need to tell my personal story uh, that it was when I work in California, in San Diego, in laboratory studying slime molds, social amoeba, and it was the time then uh, lab in, in which I worked, uh, Professor Rick Fertel, focused um, on studying hemotaxis and aggregation, how starving single amoebas get together into aggregates and then they go through morphogenesis and development, make, making multicellular organisms. But the lab was to pretty much focused on studying hemotaxis and aggregation, and that's a fantastic example of a principle of emergence. Uh, the time when I was working in the lab, uh, studying hemotaxis and doing genetics and biochemistry, cell biology experiments with dictyostelium, uh, that very time I happened to be in a shopping area nearby, not that far from the campus of University of California, San Diego, in university town center area and happened to be in a Starbucks cafe nearby bookstore, uh, enter that bookstore and found very interesting book in that bookstore. And the book is a book called Emergence, The Connected Lives of Ants, Brains, Cities and Software, uh, published in 2001 by, edit, by publisher Scribner. And uh, this book is written by uh, fantastic science journalist Stephen Johnson. And that's how I first got familiar with Stephen Johnson's books. And the first book that I encountered was booked called Emergence. And Amazingly, I, looking in the, from page to page, reading, uh, going through, scrolling this book, uh, 
I encounter that there is a, a pretty much uh, interesting uh, description of dictyostelium and the studies of dictyostelium in this book that was dealing with many other concepts and examples of the principle of emerging emergence. So I just uh, realized that I am working in a wet lab uh, on that very model organism and uh, it is one of the subjects of the book by Stephen Johnson. So I bought that book, I read the book, and uh, here I uh, read you just uh, excerpt as uh, a little bit, a piece, a fragment from the book that describes uh, dictyostelium research, presents dictyostelium as an example of a principle of emergence. So let me please uh, read that fragment to you. Uh, again, it's Stephen Johnson, book called Emergence, Connected Lives of Ants, Brains, Cities and Software. I read to you introduction. Here comes everybody. In August of 2000, a Japanese scientist named Toshiyuki Nakagaki announced that he had trained a amoeba-like organism called slime mold to find the shortest road through a maze. Nakagaki had placed the mold in a small maze comprising four possible roads and planted pieces of food at two of the exits. Despite its being incredibly primitive organism, a close relative of ordinary fungi, with, a centralized, with no centralized brain whatsoever. The slime mold managed to plot most efficient road to the food, stretching its body through the maze uh, that it connected directly to the two food sources without any apparent cognitive resources. The slime mold had solved the maze puzzle. For such a simple organism, the slime mold had an impressive intellectual pedigree. Nakagaki's announcement was only the latest in a long chain of investigations into subtleties of slime mold behavior. For scientists, trying to understand systems that use uh, relatively simple components to build higher level intelligence, slime mold may someday be as equivalent of finches and tortoises Darwin observed in Galpagos Islands. How did such a uh, lowly organism come to play uh, such an important scientific role. Story begins late 60s in New York City with scientist named Evelyn Fox Keller. Harvard PhD in physics, Keller had written her dissertation on molecular biology and she had spent some time exploring the nascent field non-equilibrium thermodynamics, which later years would come to be associated with complexity theory. By 1968, she was working as associate at Sloan Kettering in Manhattan, thinking about the application of mathematics to biological problems. Mathematics had played such tremendous role in expanding our understanding of physics, color thought. So perhaps it might also be useful for understanding living systems. In spring 1968, Keller met, met visiting scholar named Lee Siegel, an uh, applied mathematician who shared her interests. It was Siegel who first introduced her to the bizarre conduct of a slime mold. 
and together they began a series of inv investigations that would help transform not just our understanding of biological development, but also the desperate worlds of brain science, software design, and urban studies. Yeah, if you are reading these words during summer in a suburban or rural part of the world, chances are somewhere near you a slime mold is growing. Walk through normally cool, damp section of the forest on a dry and sunny day or sift through the bark mulch that lies on a garden floor and you may find grotesque substance coating a few inches of rotting wood. On a first inspection, reddish, orange mass suggests that the neighbor's dog had eaten something. Disagreeable. But if you observe the slime mold over several days, or even better, capture it with time-lapse photography, you'll discover that it moves ever so slowly across the soil. If weather conditions grow wetter and cooler, you may return to the same spot and find the creature has disappeared altogether. Has it wandered off uh, to some other parts of the forest or somehow vanished into thin air like a puddle of water evaporating? As it turns out, slime mold, Dictyostelium discaidum, has done something far more mysterious, a trick of biology that had confounded scientists for centuries before Keller and Siegel began their collaboration. The slime mold behavior was so odd, in fact, that understanding it required thinking outside the boundaries of traditional disciplines, which may be why it took a molecular biologist with physics PhD instincts to unravel the slime mold's mystery. For that is no disappearing act on the garden floor. Slime mold spends much of its time as thousands of distinct single cold units, each moving separately from its other contraries. So let me read it again. Walk through a normally cool, damp section of a forest on a dry and sunny day, or sift through the bark mulch that lies on the garden floor, and you may find grotesque substance coating a few inches of rotting wood. On first inspection, the reddish-orange mass suggests that the neighbor's dog has eaten something disagreeable, but if you observe the slime mold over several days, or even better, capture it with time-lapse photography, you will discover that it moves ever so slowly across the soil. If the weather conditions grow wetter and cooler, you may return to the same spot and find the creature has disappeared altogether. Has it wandered off to some other parts of the forest? or somehow vanished into a thin air like a puddle of water evaporating? As it turns out, the slime mold, Dictyostelium discaidum, has done something far more mysterious, trick of biology that had confounded scientists for centuries, before Keller and the Siegel began their collaboration. The slime mold, 
behavior was so odd, in fact, that understanding it required thinking outside the boundaries of traditional disciplines, which may be why it took molecular biologists with physics PhD instincts to unravel the slime mold's mystery. For that is no disappearing act on the garden floor. The slime mold spends much of its life as thousands of distant single cells units, each moving separately from its other comrades. Under the right conditions, those myriad cells will coalesce again into a single larger organism, which when begins its uh, leisurely crawl across the garden floor, consuming rotting leaves and wood as it moves about. Then environment is less hospitable, the slime mold acts as a single organism. When weather turns cooler and the mold enjoys large food supply, it becomes they. The slime mold oscillates between being a single creature and a swarm. While slime mold cells are relatively simple, they have attracted disproportionate amount of attention from a number of different disciplines. Embryology, mathematics, computer science, because they display such intriguing example of coordinated group behavior. Anyone who has ever contemplated the great mystery of human physiology, how do all my cells manage to work so well together? We will find something uh, resonant in the slime mold swamp. If we could only figure out how dictyostelium pull it off, maybe we would gain some insight on our own baffling togetherness. I was at Sloan Kettering in the biomath department, and it was very small department. Color says today laughing. While the field of mathematical biology was relatively new in the late 60s, it had fascinating, if enigmatic, precedent in then little known essay written by Alan Turing, the brilliant English codebreaker from World War II, who also helped invent the digital computer. One of the Turing's last published papers, before his death in 1954, had studied the riddle of morphogenesis, the capacity of all cell forms to develop even more uh, baroque bodies out of impossibly simple beginnings. Turing's paper had focused more on the recurring numerical patterns of flowers, but it demonstrated, using mathematical tools, how complex organism could assemble itself without any master planner calling the shots. I was thinking about slime mold aggregation as a model for thinking about development, and I came across Turing's paper, Keller says now, from her office in MIT, and I thought, bingo! For some time, researchers had understood that slime cells emitted common substance called acrazine, also known a cyclic MP, which was somehow involved in the aggregation process. But until Keller began her investigations, the conventional belief had been that slime mold swarms formed at the command of pacemaker cells 
that ordered the other cells to begin aggregating. In 1962, Harvard's Schaeffer showed how pacemakers could use cyclic AMP as a signal of sorts to rally their troops. Uh, the slime mold generals would release the compounds at the appropriate moments, triggering waves of cyclic AMP that washed through the entire community as each isolated cell relayed the signal to its neighbors. Slime mold aggregation, in effect, was a giant game of telephone, but only a few elite cells placed the original call. It seemed like a perfectly reasonable explanation. We naturally predisposed to think in terms of pacemakers, whether we are talking about fungi, political systems, or our own bodies. Our actions seem governed for the most part by pacemaker cells in our brains. And for millennia, we have built elaborate pacemaker cells into our social organizations, whether they come in the form of kings, dictators, or city councilmen. Much of the world around us can be explained in terms of common systems in hierarchies. Why should it be any different for a slime mold? But Schaeffer's theory had one small problem. No one could find the pacemakers. While all observers agreed that waves of cyclic AMP did indeed flow through the slime mold community before aggregation, all the cells in the community were effectively interchangeable. None of them possessed any distinguishing characteristics that might elevate them to pacemaker status. Schaeffer's theory had presumed the existence of cellular monarchy com commanding the masses, but as it turned out, all slime mold cells were created equal. For the 20 years that followed the publication of Schaeffer's original essay, mycologists assumed that missing pacemaker cells were a sign of insufficient data, poorly designed experiments. The generals were there somewhere in a mix, the scholars assumed. They just didn't know what their uniforms looked like yet. But uh, Keller and Siegel uh, took another, more radical approach. Turning work on the morphogenesis had, during work on morphogenesis had uh, sketched out mathematical model wherein simple agents following simple rules could generate amazingly complex structure. Perhaps the aggregations of slime mold cells were a real world example of that behavior. Turing had uh, focused primarily on interactions between cells in a single organism, but it was perfectly reasonable to assume that the math would work uh, for aggregation of free uh, floating cells. And so Keller started to think, what if Schaefer had uh, wrong all along? What if the community of the slime mold cells were organizing themselves? What if there were no pacemakers? Keller and the Siegel uh, hunch paid off 
dramatically. While they were lacked the advanced uh, visualization tools of today's computers, the two scratched out series of equations using pen and paper. Equations that uh, demonstrated how slime mold cells could trigger aggregation without following a leader. Simply by altering the amount of cyclic AMP, they released individually, then following males of the pheromone that they encountered as they wandered through their environment. If slime mold cells pumped out enough cyclic AMP, clusters of cells would start to form. Cells would begin following trails created by other cells, creating positive feedback loop that encouraged uh, more cells to join the cluster. If each solo cell was simply releasing cyclic AMP based on its own local assessment of the uh, general condition. Keller and Siegel argued in a paper published in 1969. Then the larger slime mold community might well be able to aggregate based on the global changes in the environment, all without a pacemaker cell calling the shots. The response was very interesting. Keller says now, for anyone who understand applied mathematics or had any experience in fluid dynamics, this was old head to them. But uh, to biologists, it didn't make any sense. I would give seminars to biologists and they would say, so where is the founder cell? Where is the pacemaker? It didn't provide any satisf sat satisfaction to them whatsoever. Indeed, the pacemaker hypothesis would continue as a reigning model for another decade until the series of experiments convincingly proved that slime mold cells were organizing from below. That it amazes me how difficult it is for people to think in terms of collective phenomena, Keller said today. 30 years after the two researchers first stretched out their theory on paper, slime mold aggregation is now recognized as the classic case study in a bottom-up behavior. Keller's colleague at MIT, Mitch Resnick, has even developed a computer simulation of slime mold cells aggregating, allowing students to explore the eerie invisible hand of self-organization by altering number of cells in the environment and the levels of cyclic AMP diminished, distributed. First time users of Resnick uh, simulation invariably say that on screen images brilliant clusters of red cells and green pheromone trails remain, remi remind uh, of video games and in fact the comparison reveals secret lineage. Some of today's most popular computer games resemble slime mold cells because they are loosely based 
on the equations that Köhler and the Siegel formulated by hand in the late uh, 60s. We, link, uh, we like to talk about life on Earth evolving out of the primordial soap. We could just as easily say that the most interesting digital life on our computer screens today evolved out of the slime mold. You can think of Siegel and Keller's breakthrough as one of the first few stones to start tumbling at the outset of landslide. Other stones were moving along with theirs. Some of those trajectories will follow in the coming pages, but that initial movement was nothing compared to avalanche that followed over the next two decades. At the end of its course, that landslide had somehow conjured up a handful of fully credited scientific disciplines, a global network of research labs and think tanks, and entire patterns of buzzwords. Thirty years after Köhler challenged the pacemaker hypothesis, students now take courses in self-organization studies and bottom-up software helps organize web's most lively virtual communities. But Köhler's challenge did more than help trigger a series of intellectual trends. It also unearthed a secret history of decentralized thinking, a history that had been submerged for many years beneath the weight of pacemaker hypothesis and traditional boundaries of scientific research. People had been thinking about emerging behavior in all its diverse ways for centuries, if not millennia. But all that thinking had consistently been ignored as unified body of work, because there was nothing unified about its body. There were isolated cells pursuing the mysteries of emergence, but no aggregation. Indeed, some of the great minds of the last few centuries, Adam Smith, Friedrich Engels, Charles Darwin, Alan Turing, contributed to unknown science of self-organization. But because the science didn't exist yet as recognized field, their work ended up being filled on more uh, familiar shelves. From a certain angle, those taxonomies made sense because the leading figures of this new discipline didn't even themselves realize that they were struggling to understand the laws of emergence. They were wrestling with local issues in clearly defined fields, how ant colonies learn to forage and build nests, why industrial neighborhoods form along class lines, how our minds learn to recognize faces. You can answer all these questions without resorting to scientists of complexity and self-organization, but those answers all share common pattern, as clear as the whorls of a fingerprint. But to see it as a pattern, you needed to encounter it in several contexts. Only when the pattern was detected did people begin to think about studying self-organizing systems on their own merits. Köhler and Siegel saw it in the slime mold assemblages. <laughs>
Jane Jacobs saw it in the formation of city neighborhoods. Marvin Minsky in the distributed networks of the human brain. What features do all those systems share? In the simplest terms, they solve problems by drawing on masses of relatively stupid elements, rather than a single intelligent executive branch. They are bottom-up systems, not top-down. They get their smarts from below. In a more technical language, there are complex adaptive systems that display emergent behaviors. In those systems, agents residing on one scale start producing behavior that lies on the scale above. Ants create colonies, urbanites create neighborhoods, single pattern recognition software learn how to recognize new books. The movement from low-level rules to higher-level sophistication is what we call emergence. Imagine a billiard table populated by semi-intelligent semi motorized billiard balls that have been programmed to explore the space of the table and alter their movement patterns based on specific interactions with other balls. For the most part, the table is in a permanent motion, with balls colliding constantly, switching directions on the speed every second. Because they are mo motorized, they never slow down unless their rules instruct them to, and their programming enables them to take unexpected turns when they encounter other balls. Such a system would define the most elemental form of complex behavior. System with multiple agents, dynamically interacting in multiple ways, following local rules and oblivious to any higher level instructions. But it wouldn't truly be uh, considered emergent until those local interactions result in some kind of discernible macro-behavior. Macro behavior. Say the local rules of behavior followed by the balls ended up dividing the table into two clusters of even number and odd-numbered balls. That would mark the beginnings of emergence, the higher-level pattern arising out of parallel complex interaction between local agents. The balls aren't uh, programmed explicitly to cluster in two groups. They are programmed to follow much more random rules. A sphere of left, when they collide with a solid color, accelerate after contact with the three ball, stop dead in their tracks when they hit the eight ball, and so on. Yet out of these low-level routines, a coherent shape emerges. Does that make our mechanized billiard table adaptive? Not really, because a table divided between two clusters of balls is not terribly useful either to be a billiard balls themselves or to anyone else in the pool hall. But like the proverbial Hamlet writing uh, monkeys, if we had infinite number of tables in our pool hall, each following different set of rules, one of those tables might randomly hit upon a rule set that would arrange all the balls in a perfect triangle, leaving the cue ball across the table ready for the break. That would be adaptive behavior in a larger ecosystem of the pool hall, assuming that it was in, a, in the interest of our billiard system to attract players. The system would use local rules between interacting agents to create higher level behavior 
well suited to its environment. Emerging complexity without adaptation is like the intricate crystals formed by a snowflake. It's a beautiful pattern, but it has no function. The forms of emergent behavior that we'll examine in this book show a distinct quality of growing smarter over time and of responding to the specific and changing needs of their environment. In that sense, most of the systems we'll look at um, are more uh, dynamic than our adaptive billiards table. They rarely settle in or on a single frozen shape. They form patterns in time as well as space. A better example might be a table that self-organizes into a billiard-based timing device. With the cue ball bouncing off the eight ball 60 times a minute and the remaining balls shifting from one side of the table to another every hour on the, on the hour. That might sound like an unlikely system to emerge out of the local interaction between individual balls. But your body contains numerous organic clocks built out of the simple cells that function in remarkably similar ways. Infinite number of cellular or billiard ball configuration will not produce a working clock and only a teeny number of will. So, the question becomes, how do you push your emergent system toward clockwise behavior, if that's your goal? How do you make a self-organized system more adaptive? That question has become uh, particularly crucial, because history of emergence has entered a new phase in the past few years, one that should prove to be more evolutionary than the two phases before it. In the first phase, inquiring minds struggled to understand the forces of self-organization without realizing what they were up against. In the second, certain uh, sectors of the scientific community began to see a self-organization as a problem that uh, transcended local disciplines and set out to solve the problem, particularly by comparing behavior in one area to behavior in another, by watching the slime mold cells next to the ant colonies, you could see the shared behavior in ways that would have been unimaginable watching either on its own. Self-organization became object of study in its own right, leading to creation of celebrated research centers, such as Santa Fe Institute, which devoted itself to study of complexity in all its diverse forms. But in a third phase, the one that began sometime in the past decade, the one that lies at the very heart of this book, we stopped analyzing emerging and started creating it. We began building self-organizing systems into our software applications our video games, our art, our music. We built emergent systems to recommend new books, recognize our voices, find mates. For as long as the complex organisms have been alive, they have lived under the laws of self-organization. But in the recent years, our day-to-day -day life has become overturned with artificial emergence. System built with a conscious understanding of what emerging is, systems designed to exploit those laws, the same way our nuclear reactors exploit the laws of atomic physics. Up to now, philosophers of emergence have struggled to interpret the world, but they are now starting to change it. What follows is a tour of fields that aren't usually gathered between the same book jacket covers. We look at the computer games that uh, simulate living ecologies, uh, guild system of 12th century Florence, the initial cell division that marked the very beginning of life, 
software that lets you see the patterns of your own brain. What unites those different phenomena is a recurring pattern and shape, network of self-organization, uh, disparate agents that unwittingly create a higher level order. At each scale, you can see imprint of those slime mold cells converging. At each scale, the laws of emergence hold true. This book roughly follows the chronology of three historical phases. The first section introduces one of the emerging world uh, crowning achievements, colony behavior of social instincts, uh, such as ants and termites, and then goes back to trace part of the history of the decentralized mindset from angles on the street of Manchester uh, to the new forms of emergent software being developed today. The second section is an overview of emergence as we currently understand it. Each of the four chapters in the section explores one of the uh, field's core principles, neighbor interaction, pattern recognition, feedback, indirect control. The final section looks uh, to a future of artificial emergence and speculates on what will happen when our media experiences and political movements are largely shaped by bottom-up forces, not top-down ones. Certain shapes and patterns hover over different moments in time, haunting and inspiring the individuals living through those periods. The epic clash and subsequent resolution of the dialectic animated the first half of the 19th century. Darwinian and social reform movements scattered web imagery through the second half of the century. The first few decades of the 20th century found their ultimate expression in exuberant anarchy of the explosion, while later decades lost themselves in a faceless, faceless regime of the greed. You can see the last 10 years or so as a return to those Victorian webs. Though I suspect the image that had been born into our retinas over the past decade is more prosaic. Windows peeled atop one another on a screen or perhaps a mouse clicking on an icon. These shapes a shorthand for a moment to time, in time, a way of evoking an era and its peculiar obsessions. For individuals living within those periods, the shapes are cognitive building blocks, tools for thought. Charles Darwin, George Eliot, use the web as a way of understanding biological evolution and social struggles. Half century later, the futurist embraced the explosions of machine gun fire, while Picasso uh, used them to recreate the horrors of a war in uh, Guernica. The shapes are a way of interpreting the world, and while no shape completely represents it epo its epoch, they are an undeniable component of the history of thinking. When I imagine the shape that will hover above the first half of the 21st century, what comes to mind is not the uh, coiled embrace of the genome or the etched lattice work of the silicon chip. It is instead the pulsing red and green pixels of Mitch Resnick's slime mold simulation moving erratically across the screen at first, then slowly coalescing into larger forms. The shape of those clusters, with their lifelike irregularity, their absent pacemakers, 
is the shape that will define the coming decades. I see them on the screen growing and dividing, and I think, that way lies the future.